everyone. My name is Aaron. This is Jacob. Welcome to To Teach One, the health and wellness podcast that empowers you by improving awareness of your mental, social, and physical being through shared experience. Thank you for choosing to spend this time with us, and thank you for investing in yourself. Our topic today is identity, authenticity, and self, and we have a couple guests with us. Um, she is a licensed addiction counselor, a licensed professional counselor candidate, a certified motivational interviewing therapist, and a PhD student at Walden University. Her name is Kelly King. Her email is kellyking at 1012 at gmail.com, and her Instagram is kellyk1012. Now, also with this, he's a, a BA in public relations from Murray State University, and he has a personal story of authenticity to share with us. His email is wesley.yinger, that's uh, J-U-E-N-G-E-R at gmail.com. He can also be reached on Instagram at wesyinger, that's W-E-S-J-U-E-N-G-E-R. R, and his name is Wes Yinger, if you haven't guessed that already. <laughs> so <laughs> welcome, guys. Uh, it's great to have you on the show. I'm really looking forward to it. You may have noticed, our regular listeners, that Adrian, our uh, founder and co-host, is not with us today. So he's actually in Houston, where his uh, cousin from Kenya is competing in a beauty pageant. So it's uh, really kind of cool. She had the opportunity to come here and compete in this pageant, and uh, he decided to fly down and support her. But we didn't want to put this off because it's uh, we've been wanting to get to this topic for a while. It's really interesting to talk about how you know being true and authentic to yourself can affect your emotional, mental, and even your physical well-being. And you know we had had uh, Jacob on to talk about alternative spirituality. And I know he made a really interesting comment on that episode where he talked about how a lot of what he did in his counseling was getting people to just be congruent with their own personal beliefs. And I know from the brief amount of time that I've uh, studied some counseling skills that that's, that's a huge part of a lot of the current day thinking and what makes good mental health is just the congruency, the agreement between what you believe and who you are and who you present yourself to be to the world, right? So uh, you might go ahead and introduce yourself, guys. I'm Kelly. Hello, Kelly. <laughs> Hi, Kelly. Hi. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Cool. Yeah, it's great to have you. Yeah, my name is Wes, and like Kelly said, thanks for having me. I'm excited. I've never done anything like this before, so looking forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, we're super excited about it. Of course, everybody remembers Jacob. Howdy. Uh, the white shark, um, also known around uh, the parts where we live as the big dog. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, it's great to have everybody here. And did anything uh, exciting happen to you all this week? Y'all want to talk about uh, any, any fun, fun stories or anything? No? No, no worries. Huh? No worries. Everybody's a little bit one nervous. At a time, one at a time. You have to keep in mind that some of us in the room are counselors, and we cannot talk about that. <laughs> yeah. but. That's right. Yeah. That was funny. Right before, the, uh, right before we started recording, we, uh, I realized that. I was like, oh, yeah, we're all covered by uh, some very strict federal regulations about <laughs> the stories we can and cannot tell. <laughs> so the stories that happened at work, no. And I mean, except for about the ham sandwiches, which we, we can discuss ham sandwiches, but that's really about it. <laughs> like looking at Jacob across the room, like don't blink, don't don't blink, <laughs> keep a straight face. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, so Adrian is in Houston, and I think if you're listening to this episode, the episode you would have listened before this was a bit of a departure for us. And you guys, I know, probably don't know, um, but we did an episode on battlefield medicine. Wow. Which is a little bit outside of what we normally do, but we thought we would, you know, do a little bit of history. And since we're a health and wellness podcast, that's what we did. So we hope everybody enjoyed that episode. We're going to do some more episodes like that in the future if we get a good response. So if you like the episode and if you have anything that you'd like to talk to us about or join in this community that we're trying to create, we can be reached at our website, which is www.2teach1.com. That's the number two, the word teach, and the number one.com. We're also on Instagram and Facebook at 2teach1, and that is T 
T-W-O-T-E-A-C-H-O-N-E. So, you know, we're always looking for feedback. We're always looking for constructive criticism. And, you know, just uh, give us a shout out and let you know what you think. Please. Right. Please cool. do. Yes, absolutely. So why don't we go ahead and uh, dive right on into the meat and get started with today's topic. Yeah, so Kelly and Wes are here to talk about identity. I guess just to get us rolling, um, I'm curious as to what what helped you guys land on that topic. Um, why is this something that you feel like you need to speak on? Mm -hmm. So this is a topic that I chose, um, one for a personal reason, um, because I have had periods in my life where I wasn't true to my authentic self, and I saw the negative consequences of that. So I think that was the first reason why I chose this topic. And the second reason is because uh, working as a substance abuse counselor, this is a topic that comes up almost on a daily basis, um, is just kind of the topic of identity. And a lot of times what I see is what the value set is, our behaviors and our actions don't align with that value set. And um, like I said, there are negative consequences for that. In our field, a lot of times it's addiction, but not being true to your authentic, authentic self can actually manifest it, itself in a lot of different ways. And so I thought this would be a really good opportunity to kind of have that conversation about why it's so important, but also some of the negative consequences that can come about um, if we're not true to our authentic self and what that means. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that there's uh, a lot more of the general public uh, who this can kind of speak to th than you would really think, you know, um, I, I don't know that a lot of people give it a whole lot of thought uh, unless they're experiencing those, those consequences. Um, so, so I would agree. This is something that's needs to be said and heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think that was one of the reasons why I really wanted Wes to come in with me today, um, in hopes that maybe he could share a little bit about his experience, with being true to his, his authentic self and maybe times in his life where he hasn't been um, and what that's been like for him. Um, because I speak about it in terms of addiction, um, but you're absolutely right that there are a lot of other situations with just people in everyday life where this affects, I actually would venture to say this probably affects everybody at some point yeah. in time in their life. Yeah. Um, so it's a great topic for really anybody to talk about. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, just to kind of touch on what Kelly said, I mean, once you're kind of true to your authentic self, no, and no matter what shape or form, you know, we're perfect examples of what can happen when you are true to yourself and all the good things that happen for us once we got that off of our shoulders. So any kind of opportunity to kind of push that out into the world and people look at you and relate to you and is, is always a good thing. So, yeah. Yeah, I think of this, too, as, like, values in general. I mean, I know Wes and I both grew up in a very um, conservative uh, Midwestern. We grew up in different towns, but, you know, conservative Midwestern towns. And so the value set of a lot of the people around us were very conservative. And um, I grew up in a very Christian Catholic household. And so um, really where this comes into play for me is my sexuality. And so I really struggled with my sexuality. Um, and I think a big part of that was just the culture that I grew up in and the household and yeah. the value set that I grew up in. Um, and so unfortunately for me, I wasn't able to be, I did not feel like I was able to be true to that uh, part of myself, which really had negative consequences for me and manifested itself in an addiction, which um, unfortunately took a hold of my life for, for more years than I would like it have sure. to have yeah. done. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure Wes might be able to share a little bit about what his experience was like because it didn't manifest in an addiction. But um, I don't know if you want to share about what it was like for you. Yeah, I think just the, I mean, Kelly and I both grew up in small towns. And I mean, there wasn't much diversity in any shape or form. All of, all of my friends were, we all looked the same. We all dressed the same. We all acted the same. We listened to the same music. We wore the same clothes. I mean... It was just kind of, there was no diversity whatsoever as far as religion, as far as gay, straight, whatever. And, you know, growing up in an environment where there is no diversity like that, it's kind of hard to accept that when you are different, you know, it's just hard to accept. Yeah. And um, I struggled with it for a long time. It just kind of, 
and like Kelly said, I didn't, it didn't manifest in an addiction or anything like that, but it definitely held me back in a lot of ways as far as being confident in who I am and just being true to myself. And, and that's, that's a, that's a bad thing in general <laughs> when yeah. you're not happy with yourself and not happy with who you are. And it took me a while to get there, but I'm there now and that's all that matters. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, um, you know, we talked about how at the very beginning that it can have not only emotional and mental consequences, but there can be physical, you know, ramifications for that as well. Um, and I can think back to a period of time, like when I was not being true to myself and I was really lying about who I was, you know, I wasn't eating healthy. I wasn't sleeping right. You know, I really just had very little peace of mind about the life that I was living. So it did affect my physical health. But then also, of course, I think the more obvious for me is that mental and emotional well-being, um, which is really sad to, to think about, you know, not being able to be true to yourself can really be pretty detrimental to a life. Yeah. yeah and when you're holding something back like that, I mean, it's it becomes a full-time job in itself, just trying to cover up whatever you're trying to cover up. So it's like living a double life. Yeah. yeah. And that can play in a lot of ways. It can it can affect your career. It can affect your relationships. It can it can affect so many things. And you know, when you wake up thinking about something, you go to sleep thinking about something. It's just a constant, always in your head. It just it's exhausting. <laughs> well, and it's interesting because over the last I would say twenty to twenty five years, it seems like you know, in the larger cities, right, it has become way more acceptable to just be whoever. So. You know, you could be gay, you could be straight, maybe you want to uh, dress a certain way, like be a hipster, be, you know, there's all kinds of different manifestations of human culture and of, you know, just how human beings want to live. And it, it seems like there is this difference between like a larger city and then smaller towns. I'm not sure exactly why that is, because I know where I grew up in Texas was like that. Uh, it was a suburb of Dallas. And... Even though it's not the exact same thing, there was definitely this uh, push to be like everybody else. Like you were not encouraged to be different, to stand out in any way, you know. So I know anybody who didn't kind of look like this prototypical, um, I don't exactly know what you describe them as, was, you know, you were made fun of. There was this... Uh, Mm -hmm. this winnowing where you didn't want to suffer that. Like you saw what happened to this guy over here who acted a little bit different. So you just didn't do that. And then, you know, that's so depressing and it's so, uh, this, it's not a way to live. Right. And I love how just society in general is kind of waking up to that. And that's part of what this podcast is about is allowing people that freedom to just be who they naturally are is vitally important to people's happiness. And I kind of, you know, I think back like, you know, 50, 60 years, 100 years, like all those people that, you know, wanted to be different but just completely had to hide it under whatever the norm was. And I think that ends up with a lot of, I mean, I wonder, you know, there's a lot of violence and uh, just emotional reactions of any kind outside of what would be considered to be good or normal, how much of that was caused by internal repression, right? They just couldn't be who they were in any way. And so they end up, you know, all that's coming out uh, sideways, so to speak, you know? Yeah, definitely. I, it makes me, this is kind of sad, but it makes me think of um, our youth and how like we have L LGBTQ youth that the suicide rates for those individuals are on the rise because there's not outlets for those individuals. And, you know, they're of course not taught about about that type of stuff in school at that age. And so, you know, they may not feel accepted. They may not feel like they have an outlet. Um, they may feel like they can't be who they truly are or they don't even know how to start that conversation. And so unfortunately, sometimes that outlet for them is to, like you said, act out, but yeah. then also could end in something really tragic like a suicide, which is really, you know, it is really sad that, you know, people yeah. resort to that to not be who they truly are because they're afraid of what that might mean for them. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty serious fear right there. Yeah. When the alternative, uh, is to take your own life. That's, 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 uh, that's quite the, the place to be stuck. It sounds. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, and I think in small communities like where we grew up, it's you know a lot more eyes are on you. A lot of people know mm, who you are. Yeah. They know your family, and that was kind of my struggle. I not that I was not that I think I would have had a bad experience coming out in my hometown, but but I knew it would be on the tip of everyone's tongue, and I didn't right. want that kind of attention. Sure, and I just that's just small town life and just the way it is, but. Hmm. Yeah, I think a big part of it for me, too, and my parents would probably say, oh, we will love you no matter what, which I think that they, well, they do. But, you know, I think I was always afraid to tell them because I didn't sure. want to be, I didn't want to be the disappointment. I didn't want to be that kid who, yeah. you know, oh, you know, we grew up in this faith and we've instilled all these values in you. And, you know, you're doing literally the opposite of, of what we brought you up to do. So I think that was a big part of my struggle as well is just not wanting to be that disappointment. And I think for me, um, you know, it's amazing. I feel like I was able to do this, but I did not want to be that person so badly that I would lie to myself on a regular basis that I actually started to believe it was true that I was straight. You know, that's how much I lied to myself about mm -hmm. that. And so, yeah. yeah, it's just crazy the things that we'll do to um, avoid that discomfort. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, and you kind of fall into what other people perceive of you, you know. I worked in my hometown for five years after college and constantly got the question, why are you single? Where's your wife? Where's your girlfriend? Where's right. what's happening? What's wrong with you? <laughs> and like, it just got to be too much. And I just had to get out, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that it, interestingly enough, that's kind of leading me to the question that I have, which is, uh, if you, if you guys want to share, like, what was the, the catalyst? Like what was the final straw to which, you, you know, you, you finally decided, I just, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Was there any one incident, I guess, or, or was it just a buildup of, of many? It, for me, it had been building up for a couple of years. You know, I bought a house in my hometown a mile away from my parents' house and lived there for a few years before I decided to move out to Colorado. And actually Kelly and her now fiance, who is my cousin, Holly, I moved in with them and lived with them for a year. And the whole basis of me moving out to Colorado was just kind of, I need space to figure out who the heck do I want to be here? Do I want to be, do I want to be true or do I want to keep putting up this front? Hmm. And so I moved out here and moved in with Kelly and Holly and saw how happy they were. And it was really a catalyst for me to, you know, I can have that too. And it was a very good environment to come into and, it's probably a year I lived there, maybe a yeah, little under a year. a year. And then I finally yeah. came, Kelly and Holly were the first people I ever came out to. <laughs> and it and was surprise, we were accepting. It's weird. Shocking, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. Yeah. <laughs> so, but no, I mean, back home, I was just, I was just kind of drowning in myself and my thoughts. And I actually had kind of went on a few dates with a girl and I was like, what, what happens if I, if this progresses and I marry this girl, just like everyone expects me to. And then we have kids and then I figure it out. And right. that, well, yeah. that terrified me because then other people are involved mm -hmm. and I did, I did not want to be that person. So, so yeah, but Colorado changed me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think for me, it was the addiction piece. Um, I had been drinking very heavily for, Oh, geez. I haven't done that math in a while, but um, I had been drinking pretty heavily for probably six or seven years, um, and I, it was getting to the point where it was getting pretty bad. Um, and so I did decide to go to treatment, and it wasn't until I was in treatment and working with a counselor um, that we kind of figured out what was at the root of what was really going on, which was that I wasn't being true to my authentic self and that um, I really needed to reevaluate my sexuality, which I didn't want to hear at the time, but I knew that I didn't want to go back to drinking and I was willing to do whatever I needed to do to make sure I did not do that. So um, it took me a while to come out to my parents. I did like Wesley, I moved out to Colorado to um, just kind of pursue a different life and to get some space from, 
you know, that small rural Indiana life. And um, I met some really awesome people out here who accepted me and I ended up meeting Holly, who is now my fiance. And I was really happy for the first time in a very long time. So um, I saw that I could have all of that happiness. And so, you know, there was really no turning back after that. And I think I came out to my parents, maybe, oh, I want to say maybe like six or seven months after I moved out to Colorado and and they still love me, so yeah. we're good. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't as bad as I thought. Yeah. So. Who was the first person you came out to? I'm just curious. Um, it was probably my therapist mm. at in treatment. I would say mm. interesting. And then yeah. and then Kate, my friend Katie in Boulder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's interesting how you know because I also went through treatment. Getting to whatever the core is, right? Getting to whatever the core issue is. There's. It seems to me that most of the time there's some kind of issue. And I know for me it was, a, it was a little bit different, but it was like stuff that I just hadn't dealt with that they were like, well, this is why you keep acting this way. And so maybe you want to think about that and you're like, oh, yeah. So it's kind of, like, you know, whatever it is and, and however you get to it, you know, just being free to be like, oh, okay, so it's okay that this happened or it's okay that I act this way or it's okay that I want to do these things. It's totally okay. And somebody for the first time was like, yeah, yeah, you're you. This is who you are. And if you just deal with it, I bet you your life will be so much better. And it is, right? So just, uh, you know, going through that process is amazing. And that's, you know, that's why I want to do it. Right? That's why, um, you know, I have so much respect for those that do. But it's fascinating that we can live in such denial because part of my story of getting sober was, so I'm here in Colorado and I had nowhere to go and I'm in the hospital again because my solution was to come to Colorado and I was like, oh, the weed's legal. So if I just stay stoned 24 hours a day, seven days a week, surely that will keep me from drinking. And, uh, I don't know if anybody's tried that, but it's did, not. Did it work? Uh, no, okay. no, it did not. <laughs> And, but I ended up, so I'm in the hospital and they give me these list of places. And this is before Colorado. Now, if you don't know, Colorado has some very excellent resources. If you need treatment, um, you should seek those out. At the time though, I didn't know about them and I ended up calling this place and I ended up going there for a year. And I met a couple interesting people there and they were fundamentalist Christians. And it was archaic in the sense that they were trying to tell one of the nicest Men I have ever known with like a giant teddy bear, but you know, uh, gay, not, not straight. And they kept like ostracizing him and, and telling him he could be straight. And he was just so unhappy. And I really like, it kind of upsets me now, right? Because all of us were there because we had no other place to go. And if we had told these people that we were at, like, we don't believe like you believe, they'd be like, well, fine. So where are you going to sleep tonight? And so you're like stuck in this very fundamentalist thing. And, you know, I don't know. I, I'm still friends with him on Facebook and I'm not sure of what his, uh, his situation is, but I know like that had to be one of the most uncomfortable things that that gentleman ever went through just trying to, you know, cure uh, an addiction. It's right. like conform or else, you yeah. know, yeah. conform right. to this norm yeah. or else there'll be consequences. Yeah. yeah. And, and I know somebody and I don't think they will be listening to the podcast. So I won't mention any names, but this person is much like your story, convinced themselves that this is not who I am, but they don't seem like they're truly happy. Right. And I just wonder if that person was just free to just live their life like they desire to live it, how much happier they could be. And I don't personally see how that relates to your relationship or non-relationship or whatever you want to do as far as your religion goes. I just don't, I don't, I don't get it. You know, and it's funny because I, I saw this text, the same book in the Bible that the fundamentalists uh, all often point to, right? Also says that you can't wear more than two, um, types of fabric. Right at one time, yeah, you can't uh, do this. It has a lot of law. You can't eat fish or no shellfish. You can't. It has a lot of laws that were written like I don't know four thousand years ago. I mean, <laughs> literally, and and they point to that for this reason. And I really think it's all about fear of uh, p- 
people not conforming. And, and I think that's got to be the root of it because just trying to understand why these people were so adamant about that when most, most people this day and age, thank goodness, have moved on from archaic beliefs like that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot more of it out there than, than you really think until you're, you know, yeah. put in that situation. Um, I mean, I don't think anybody ever imagines that they're going to be put in a situation where they have to conform or, or else, right? Um, it's not something you <laughs> plan on when you leave the house in the morning. Um, <laughs> but there's a, you know, something strikes me as pretty remarkable with both Wes and Kelly um, as far as a strength. Um, and listening to your, your stories, it sounds like even though you guys were, were sort of living this this double life, not being true to yourselves at the same time, I, I couldn't help but think at least you knew what your true selves were. Mm, right. And yeah. so that's the struggle. Um, for myself early on, it was, it wasn't that it was more like, who am I? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. is a whole nother, that's a, that's a different podcast. Not to be honest, <laughs> but, <question. laughs> but, but I feel like there's, there's some, some strength, uh, in that, you know, that, that, um, that caused a lot of the struggle. I think in the beginning, you might've been better off just being naive about it and not, you know, knowing so, like, like I was, but I, I just, I just wanted to, to, to say that. Cause I feel like that's something that kind of gets overlooked, you know, that at least at that, at that time you, you, you knew that this wasn't you, mm-hmm. you, you knew who you were. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I think, th- I think, I just think there's something to be said for that. Yeah. Yeah. I think we both knew pretty early on, at least I did. It was probably middle school for me. It's just the fact that I couldn't express it and I couldn't, I couldn't really talk about it to anyone and just, it all goes back to wanting validation from other people. And that can come in any shape or form, whether you're gay, straight, whatever. And once you can get past that need for validation, then you're, you're gold. You can go places you never thought you could go. So. That's a really good point, though. Yeah. It's like the only person you really need to be, you know, to care about is yourself. Yeah. And yeah. unfortunately, sometimes we have to fall a little bit before we can realize that. But mm. I think the beauty in this is, is now that we've realized it, you know, that that we feel like we can now be true to who we are. And I have like the best peace of mind I've ever had in my life because of that. Yeah, Definitely. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, because both of your stories, you know, it's like you were kind of seeking a way to just express who you were, and you both found a way to do that. And now you're trying to give back a little bit because somebody may be hearing this and who's, for whatever reason, not living that authentic life and not really realizing how important it is. Because I think, like you said, validation was huge for me. Like realizing that a lot of my issues were constantly seeking some external validation that was that was um, the piece to just like stop doing that and to be okay with myself enough to to just live uh, my truth right and each of our truths is, is different but if you're not living it you're not going to be an effective human being i don't think you're not going to be happy and then you both have found a way to do that so there may be people out there who aren't living that truth who still believe that it's more important to fit into that form right yeah. how they look and how they're received by people rather than just being who they are. Yeah, and this obviously extends well beyond sexuality. This is just the example that we bring today. But, you know, I also think of, like, going to college, you know, um, say that you were really into art and you wanted to be an artist, but you have parents who are engineers or lawyers Mm -hmm. or doctors, and so that's the expectation that you go and do those things. Mm -hmm. Um, And that puts an incredible amount of stress on, you know, the child or the teenager who's about ready to go into college is, Mm -hmm. do I conform or do I be true to myself? And I think that that's the struggle that a lot of people go through is, unfortunately, sometimes we we feel like we need to conform. And then we have this internal conflict with ourselves that can manifest itself. We either pull ourselves out of it mm-hmm. eventually or we don't. And then there can be, you know, consequences for that. A lot of, a lot of misery. Yeah. 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 I know that's true. Uh, sometimes regret it when I, when I look at my student loan bills, but... I was in my first semester at college and I went to study business because that's what my family told me I should study. 
and I absolutely loved philosophy. I loved, I loved reading about it. It was interesting to me. And I was talking to this girl in my uh, freshman comp class. And she was like, why don't you just major in philosophy? And I was like, well, because I have to major in business. And she was like, no, you don't. I was like, you know, you're right. And I changed my major like like a week later. And I would have been horrible at business. Like, <laughs> like I don't even like math. Like, you know, like I, I, this is not who I am. Um, although when I went to apply at the uh, philosophy company, um, they didn't have any openings. So uh, the, <laughs> it's a philosophy little, company. It's a, it's a little little joke. Dot com, uh, dot com, I think. Yeah, it's philosophy dot com. Yeah, there's. Um, I mean, but, you know, an education for education's sake is perfectly acceptable if that's what you want to yeah, do. Yeah, for sure. You know, because it's your life. You know, mm-hmm. go do what you want to do. Yeah. Well, and then it makes me think of potential, right? Like if you were to go and actually major in business and that's what you ended up going to do, you might be, you know, in a career of mediocrity. Whereas if you go and do philosophy and go get a degree in that, mm-hmm. it'd be something that you really excel at. Yeah. You know, and that's the way that I look at my life now is I was living a life of mediocrity and complacency and apathy and just being okay with where I was at. I mean, I wasn't really okay, but, you know, I was teaching and I was coaching and I was kind of like, yeah, whatever. This is just where I'm going to be. I'm going to live in Indiana. And, you know, this is, yeah. this is just what I'm going to do and I'm going to mm-hmm. date men and be really unhappy about it, you know, but... Now, you know, I, after I came out, I felt the the desire to even just further my education more and to yeah. become a counselor and start to help other people. And I never would have done that had I not had that struggle and then come out, you know, on, on the other side of that, I still would have been living in Indiana, just living my life of mediocrity. Mm-hmm. So it's really about living your life to your fullest potential, um, because you'll be able to achieve so much more if you're true to you. Oh, absolutely. Right. Cause if you're, if you're living your authentic self, you're happy. And if you're happy, you're going to make good decisions. You're going to want to do things. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's not just about that thing. It affects everything. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even physiologically, like, you know, if somebody is deeply unhappy, that's going to manifest in physical symptoms. Absolutely. And, you know, and I know for myself, I'm happier and healthier than I've ever been. Right. And I'd venture to say that probably all of us around this table feel the same. And it's Mm -hmm. from the same thing, which is being, you know, in in alignment with ourselves in the Mm -hmm. world. And I I would even argue that, uh, you know, as far as uh, outcomes or byproducts of of finally aligning Mm -hmm. yourself with your 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 authentic self, if if the outcome of that is is the person, Kelly, that I see sitting in front of me today, I mean, that's the proof is in the pudding. You know, I probably have told everybody but you how much I look up to you and uh, what an asset you are to, to work with and just an amazing person. And, and even just having just met you, Wes, I have to assume that if, if, if Kelly keeps your company, <laughs> then you're a pretty, pretty high quality person. And um, so the proof is there as well that, that it's done the same for you. Yeah. Jacob's going to make me cry today. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's absolutely true. Yeah. I, I had the uh, the pleasure of being um, still a client in your first what, week of employment. And it was it was so funny. Just a small story. It was so funny because I was attending a graduation <laughs> and Kelly was passing things out. And I got one just like I was a client. And she was like, oh, yeah, wait, what are you, why are you even here? It was, it was, it was, it was kind of amusing, but no. Aaron's got jokes. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I got always, jokes. Always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, I just think it's, uh, it's a really interesting tale to tell and hopefully it's encouraging to some people to, to live their authentic life. Right. Well, and we talked a lot about vulnerability, right? Mm, like, I yeah. mean, and there's always going to be that period of uncomfortability when there's that growth period. Like I know, me going to treatment and coming out. And that was a period of uncertainty and vulnerability. And just, I don't know if this is going to be okay. I don't know if the relationships in my family are going to be okay. And luckily it's turned out really well for me, but it doesn't for other people. And Mm -hmm. and there's going to be that period where it's just going to be really tough, but it's having faith that it's going to be better on the other side. Um, that, regardless of whether the people around me accept me or not, I'm still going to be happier because I was true to myself. 
Um, and I think that there's a lot to be said for that. Well, in, in a way it kind of weeds out the suckers, right? Because then the people that are, that are left standing at the end of it all, I mean, those are the people that you want around you anyway, right? right? Like those are the quality people. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I think it's, it's kind of the knee jerk reaction with anything in life is just to go the safe route. And we're kind of the perfect example of, you know, we both took big risks in moving out here and coming out and doing the whole thing. And look at us now. I mean, we're both happier than ever. And sometimes you gotta, you gotta feel, I don't want to say unsafe. I mean, you should always feel safe, but you gotta feel uncomfortable. You gotta feel vulnerable. You gotta a little bit put of risk yourself out there. Yeah. To really make things happen for you. And I think we're prime examples of that. So. Yeah, absolutely. And we talk about that a lot is the uncomfortability. And that's the zone. When you're comfortable, that's that's fine. But that's the moment when you got to start looking to expand your horizon. Yeah. You know, because growth does not happen in, you know, on the chair, right? Growth happens when you're out running, right? You know, right. if you're, you got to be moving and, and growing. I think just to, just to stay a healthy, happy, functioning human being, in my opinion. I think when you get stagnant and when you, uh, when you just accept where you are, that's when um, decline begins to happen. Mm -hmm. So to me, the benefits of, of, of what you guys have been through and, and come out on the other side of uh, seem pretty obvious. But what would you guys say as far as like sharing with our listeners? Um, what would you guys say were some of the uh, immediate and maybe not so immediate benefits to sort of realigning yourself to, to your authentic self? I think, you know, I was obviously in a new environment and I started making new friends, you know, through work and through sports leagues and whatnot. And the fact that these people knew me a hundred percent for who I was and they loved me was huge for me. It, it did not matter whatsoever. And it kind of made me think, why didn't I do this way sooner? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could have been way happier a yeah. lot sooner in life, but, but that was, that was big for me just kind of people accepting me for who I am and, and loving me for it. And that was, that was big for me. Yeah. I would say just having so much more passion and zest for life. I mean, I'm, I realized that I started waking up in the morning and actually being excited about whatever the day was going to bring me, yeah. um, which is a huge difference where before, like I said, it was very, you know, I wasn't necessarily depressed, but I was, there was just no passion for what I was doing. Um, I think another big change with me too, is just being way more open-minded to people who are different than me and growing up in small town, rural Midwestern, you know, little pockets of the world, you know, you are around people who are like, just like you. I mean, pretty much most of the people I knew growing up were middle to upper class. They were white. They were, I went to a Catholic school. We all literally did wear the same thing because we had <laughs> uniforms, yeah. um, you know, and, and then I went to a big university. So there was more diversity there, but it really wasn't until I went to treatment and went to, and decided to, you know, finally come out that, I just started to embrace diversity around me. Um, and it's been really neat. I love surrounding myself with people who are different than me and who have different beliefs than me and different backgrounds. It's so refreshing to have a different perspective. And I used to not be like that at all. I think that the culture that I grew up in did not accept diversity. I mean, I don't even think I knew different people that existed in my, on my planet. But it so. makes me wonder a little <laughs> bit, um, how many others there were from, from your communities um, that might've been going through the same thing you were and maybe didn't ever get to that point where they were like, I, I got to make a change. They just kind of went the other way and they're somewhere now super miserable. Yeah. yeah. I wonder that often like, cause you never know. I mean, I, I think I'm a good example. I don't fit the stereotype of like a flamboyant, like super loud and proud type of, of gay person. And I think, you know, people that are that way, they kind of get looked at differently. And I don't know, I lost my train of thought. Well, I think you're, you're saying that there are people who 
they just look like everyday people. You can't just, you know, we don't walk yeah, around yeah. with like gay straight. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. On it's our not forehead. like you woke up one day and, you <laughs> know, yeah, that's what I, I was trying I'm to not just that. like wearing rainbow around. They sent everywhere. you, a, yeah. uh, you know, your new uniform. <laughs> it's just the uniform wear. you wear now, gay. Yeah. So, no, yeah. it's, no, I totally agree. My college roommate, I didn't know. And like, I live with him. We had an apartment together. Cool guy. We were just out one night and I'm like, hey, you want to go uh, try to talk to some girls? And he was like, no. Typical and, Aaron question. Yeah. Typical Aaron <laughs> question. Yeah. And uh, he was like, uh, no. And I'm like, well, how come? And he's like, well, I don't like girls. And I'm like, really? And, and the thing was, what's hilarious is this huge guy, um, Mexican, um, looked like a giant Aztec, uh, the antithesis of everything you would think of. He did. This is how we would go to my house to do his laundry. This is how he did his laundry. And Gabe, if you ever hear this, I'm sorry, but it's kind of funny. He would do his laundry. He'd put it back in the th- same thing. He brought it in. He would take it to his room, and he had clean pile and dirty pile. He didn't care about hanging anything up. There was just clean pile and dirty pile. Um, he just you, you would have no idea. And just it, what it showed me was, that, yeah, there's there's movie presentation of what things are, and then there's real life. Yeah. And rarely are they the same. Mm-hmm. Well, for me, that's not that you need any more reason, but that's. Uh, an even better reason to just approach everyone and listen to everyone that you come in contact with as if that's a possibility as if there may be something about them that you don't know, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Where, I mean, I grew up around it. I mean, people threw around derogatory terms towards gay people all the time back home. Yes. And if there's anything I could push in schools today, it's just stop it. (laughs) Yeah. Cause you never know who's dealing with what. And just yeah yeah and you'll hear people say things like oh i didn't know i wouldn't have said that had i known right and it's like how about just not say that anyway yeah right i totally agree oh so right now i'm in the middle of taking this class on culturally informed treatment and one of the forum posts that i had to read was this uh this lady she had had to discipline her kids for saying that um for using derogatory terms And I thought back to when I was a child, growing up in the 90s, late 80s and 90s in Texas, how, yes, just like you said, it was completely acceptable. No one called anybody out. And I think it's not possible that out of the, you know, thousand kids I went to school with that nobody was gay. And so here are these, you know, young men and women who were having to endure this language without any of the adults who were supposedly teaching us about how to be moral and upright and good citizens, none of them are saying anything about it. In fact, they're using those terms too and what they must have had to go through and just not even not even realizing that. It wasn't even on my radar, right? And then so this society as a whole has just taken this turn, I think, for – I mean, it's an amazing turn. And it's great because now at least this discussion is happening. Now at least there are people who are saying, no, don't talk that way because you don't know who you're talking to. And it doesn't matter really who you're talking to. How about we just eliminate that kind of speech? And it's not being politically correct. It's literally just being a decent human being. Yeah. It's being respectful. Yeah, yeah, that's all it is. It's just like don't call people names of any kind, right? Uh, and, and if you just do that – then you just eliminate that possibility of, of saying the wrong thing in front of the wrong person because I totally agree that where I came from in Texas, it wasn't just it wasn't just gay or straight. Uh, there were racial undertones. There's cultural undertones. I didn't know because so I grew up um, around all uh, basically white people, and uh, I am half white, so to speak. You know, uh, part Swedish and some Scottish in there. I didn't realize how badly I was treated and how much of that I internalized until I left there, until I got out of high school, until I looked back and I thought, wow, like most of my friends must have been raised in an environment that taught them that it was okay to talk to some people in a way that uh, is completely unacceptable, right? Which is, let's just use the word racist, and that I was accepted because I was around them, but that was it. And that had I not known them personally, their relationship with somebody of my color and where I came from would have been completely different. Sure. You know, and so I had to, I had to learn to, to realize that that's where I came from and that that's the way I was raised. 
And, you know, dealing with that and understanding it and being okay with, yeah, I am a Latino. That's I look like a Latino, but I don't speak Spanish. And my culture is American, right? It's not Mexican, even though I have ancestry that's Mexican. And it's a weird space to exist in at certain times. But coming to peace with it was crucial. And just, bam, this is who I am. This is what I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, actually, my sister and my nephew came out here to visit um, about a month ago. And my I had come out to my sister, obviously, but I hadn't come out to my nephew yet. Whenever I was going through that process, it was like he was like 10 or 11, and now he's 15, going on 16. And I actually just came out to him when he was out here visiting. And, and he's like, I, I just, I said, if I could stress anything, you know, if you're joking around with your friends, like you said, you never know who's going through what, because that's what I dealt with all through high school. And, you know, if you're going to throw an insult, find a different insult. <laughs> right. <laughs> like being gay should not be an insult. Exactly. <laughs> or just saying that's gay or that mm-hmm. should not be part of your vocabulary. And it, and to see him think about it was, was fascinating to me because he was really thinking about it. And, you know, any. 15 year old boy they're very scatterbrained and he i think it really he really thought about it and i think if we could just kind of push that and we could solve a lot of problems yeah (laughs) yeah agreed just a little common decency goes a long way Mm -hmm. yeah there's there's a lot of us out here man just (laughs) just be kind to the people around you (laughs) Right. right and it's it's funny that we even you would think that we wouldn't have to have a conversation like that. And yet it just kind of goes to show how in a lot of areas we still aren't as advanced as we might be that, um, education of youth and of, of, uh, teenagers, you know, still needs to happen that this is not an issue that's solved. It's an ongoing issue. Mm -hmm. And that language is a huge part of just who we are as human beings. And so learning to use that language appropriately, and to use it in a way that doesn't offend and, more importantly, doesn't cause someone to feel badly about themselves is so important. Mm-hmm. I think something that I've learned throughout this whole thing, too, is it's, this whole thing has required me to reevaluate my own value set. Because I think some people are okay with, and, and it's okay that they're okay with it in their own way, being okay with, you know, they're just uncomfortable in having these really difficult conversations. And so they would rather sit in silence. And I think that we get that a lot in some of the smaller communities is this makes me extremely uncomfortable. And so therefore we're just not going to have the conversation. And, and I used to live in that community, so I understand what it's like to be there. But now that I've been on the other side of it, of let's start having these really difficult, really hard, really vulnerable conversations, I would much rather live in that world where I'm surrounded by people who are willing to have those really difficult, hard conversations. So that's just a value set of mine that I probably would have never even known that I had um, had I continued to live my life of monotony back Mm -hmm. in Indiana. But it's really kind of cool. Yeah, silence is very loud in a lot of ways, very loud in your head. And it comes out in a lot of shapes and forms, whether it's an addiction, whether it's thoughts of suicide, whatever it may be. Just talk it out. Yeah. Funny enough, that kind of leads me to uh, another question that I have. Um, since I'm sitting in for Adrian, our fearless leader, uh, he had a couple questions that he wanted to ask, um, and it, it kind of ties in right here. So um, one of the things he wanted to ask you guys, uh, and, and either one of you could take this, is, is what statement would you give to your former self uh, to sort of begin changing that internal dialogue? I think it's just acknowledging that this process is really hard and validating that because, you know, I'd be kidding myself if I went back to my my past self and said, you know, this is going to be really easy. Just come out and it won't be a big deal and you'll be glad you did it. And and that's it, you know, mic drop. But, um, you know, I think that to, I would go back to myself and say, you know, like this is going to be really tough. And also you're going to find out a lot about the people who are in your life who truly support you for who you are. Um, because Jacob, your, your comment earlier was really spot on about you find out who is going to, who's going to be there for you. You know, I think I know that I definitely went through that process where I feel very fortunate that most of the people in my life were 
supportive of me. I did have a couple of those friends that I, they were the type of friends that, you know, would have been standing by me on my wedding day who are no longer in my life, you know, so it was pretty eye opening to go through that process. And I'm really grateful for that, you know, because you want those people who are going to support you no matter what. So um, I would go back and like I said, just say that it's going to be really difficult, but it's going to be a growing experience and you're going to be a lot happier because of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And just kind of piggyback off that. I mean, looking at myself now versus then it's a, it's a totally different person. And, you know, I, I built up so much energy so many times. I feel like where I was in kind of intimate moments with a close friend or someone in my family, like I should probably tell them right now. And I just couldn't get up the courage. And when I finally did, you just got to do it one time. And then the other times are so much easier. Once the words come out of your mouth to another person, it makes the world a difference. And yeah. So what you're saying is Holly and I were practice when you came out. Pretty much. (laughs) (laughs) Pretty much. But no, in all serious, like the words coming out of my mouth to someone else was like, oh God, it's happening. (laughs) Wow. Um, um, Yeah. I mean, it's all about realizing your potential where, where you can go and. Once that's off your shoulders, then unstoppable. Yeah. The sky's the limit. Yeah. Yep. Wesley's actually accomplished quite a bit since he's come out. I don't know if you want to talk about some of the stuff you've accomplished since you've come out, you know, since you've been true to your authentic self. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, once once I moved out here and came out and my family knew, my close friends knew, um, just started kind of living my life for myself, I started running and eventually started getting more fit and dropped about 70 pounds wow. and ran my first marathon. And oh, wow. Yeah. It's, it's been a, it's been a whirlwind, but it's been all good things. And once, once I had that weight off my shoulders of who I was struggling to be, it was, I just hit the ground running literally. <laughs> That's <laughs> it's awesome. Been, it's, it sounds like it, it frees up a lot of space. Oh, so much. I mean, I'm excelling in my career. I'm athletic. I've never, I would never have considered myself athletic, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's been very good. Good things just started happening for me once I was finally confident in who I was. And if there was one thing I could tell anyone out there struggling, you know, it does get better. <laughs> yeah, it definitely uh, does. Yeah. So s- speaking of, of, uh, giving bits of knowledge to our listeners and, uh, Anybody else uh, in your lives? So what are some of the ways that your connection to your true identity have, have helped you guys be of more service to the people around you, possibly to people that may be struggling in the same way? For me, I, I know it may be a little bit different, but I feel like I do this daily through my career. Yeah. But um, I think a big part of it is just spreading the message that no matter what you're going through, you're not alone in whatever it is that you're experiencing. Um, whether, you know, you're struggling with your identity or you're struggling with an addiction or you're struggling with depression or whatever it might be. I think that we live in an actually very lonely society where people feel like they're disconnected from other people and that they don't have support. Um, and so I try my best to spread that message and everything that I do, even if I can't personally relate to them, um, to just sit with somebody and just listen to what, just to hold that space for someone else, I think is incredibly important. Um, so that people know that there's at least another person in this world who's willing to give Mm -hmm. them that time, um, and who's willing to sit there and just have a conversation with them about what's going on. So Mm -hmm. I think that's an incredibly important message is you're not alone. You know, there are other people who are either like you or have experienced something like you, um, who are at least willing to support you. And so I think for me that extends beyond what I do as a career, but I try to carry that into my personal life too. Yeah. And recently I was able to take part in, I work for Anheuser-Busch, the biggest beer company in the world, and they partnered with an organization called It Gets Better, which is an organization that um, helps people struggling with who they are and and helps them throughout the coming out process Mm -hmm. through videos and with different people and Mm -hmm. kind of individual people to maybe relate to someone, you know, in some small town in Illinois struggling with who they are. And so 
I was able to take part in that project and I learned so much that there's so many resources out there and in today's day and age, you know, with the internet, I mean, you can find so many resources online and so many organizations that's, and I never would have thought to look into that whenever I was 15, 16 years old, you know, so there are resources out there and I was very happy to be a, a, be a part of that project and kind of tell my story on a national level in front of thousands of people and hoping to relate to one or two people that are struggling with who they are. I mean, if mm -hmm. it, that message gets out to one person, then I've, I sure. feel like I've done my job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's uh that's part of our um, name, you know, to teach one, right? Just yeah. one person, right? Cause that's, yeah. all that's, that's all you can do sometimes. Yeah. And if you just reach one, that's enough. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, we'd like to obviously reach more than that, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe two or three. Yeah, yeah sure. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's inspiring. And I just have Speaking to ask. Speaking of inspiring. Well, I just, <laughs> I just have to ask really quick, though. So which marathon did you run? Because, see, getting into running was, like, part of my recovery. Mm -hmm. So I love to run. Yeah. I ran Colfax. Nice. See, I haven't done the yeah. full marathon. I did the half marathon. Was it this year? Uh, the marathon was a year ago. Oh, fantastic. I ran a 10-miler this year. Oh, nice. Oh. Okay. Overachievers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Aaron, Aaron knows how I feel about running. Yeah, well, well it's a on, mind thing. It's all in your head. It's all Once in your you head. Once you can get through it, I mean, and you can do, you can do it. That's yeah. awesome. Well, Kelly did the half marathon. I did it once, <laughs> and I will probably never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did it. That's all. Right. Couldn't That's walk right. for about two weeks. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just had to ask because I also love to run. Yeah. That's that's my me time. Exactly. Yep. It's very meditative, I think. Sweating bullets today when I was running five miles, but <laughs> <laughs> my me time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Good job. So I'm curious. Um, it, it, if I'm understanding correctly, it sounds like, Kelly, you kind of came to your conclusion and realigned yourself uh, a little bit earlier than, than Wes did. So, so how has Wes's sort of realignment and, and, and kind of coming out the other end um, and moving on and growing, how, how has that inspired you? Well, I think, so I lived with Wesley as he was talking about uh, when he came out. And, um, you know, one thing that has been really neat to watch, and I know that I've shared this with you a little bit, Wes, has just been really, really inspiring to see how quickly you have made changes in your life. Um, I wish that I was as motivated as you to be as active as what you are. Um, but you've really embraced this ident your identity and you're not afraid to now share that with other people. And it was really cool. The, a couple of weeks ago, last week, two weeks ago, we were over at Wesley's for a cookout. Um, his parents were in town and surrounded by like 20, 25 friends um, who are all, I mean, it's just um, amazing how like the group of people that he's kind of gotten to rally around him and mm -hmm. who yeah. support him for who he is. And it was kind of neat because I don't know his parents all that well, um, but his it was his dad's birthday. And so everybody's saying happy birthday to him. And his dad decided to say something afterwards and you know, was thanking everyone. And he got very tearful um, and was talking about how proud he was of Wesley. And I thought that that was just so cool to – and it had to have been so nice for Wesley to hear, um, yeah. you know, and to see his dad get so emotional when he was sharing that. So it's just been really cool to – to watch how he's changed his lifestyle, but also he's so active now in our community. I mean, I never see him anymore. <laughs> you know, he's just always busy doing something different. And I'm like, where did you find this festival? <laughs> but it's just really neat because I did see, you know, when Wesley first moved out here, of course, he didn't know a lot of people. So I'm sure that that didn't help. But what weren't super social and was not out and was not, you know, that wasn't public knowledge to everyone. And so, yeah. I mean, as soon as he decided to come out, he just, everything just changed for him and in, in a very positive way. So. Yeah. And I think kind of touching on what we talked about earlier, I mean, being gay in a, in a larger city versus a small town. I mean, here in Denver, there's, there's gay football leagues, there's gay volleyball leagues, there's gay golf, there's gay running. I mean, there's so many ways to be involved with, people that are like-minded 
we're in a small town. You don't there. You don't get that. <laughs> there might be like three of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I just kind of dived in and I was like, okay, this is a new experience and I'm just going to be involved as much as I can. And maybe, maybe relay this to someone else and make them feel more comfortable. And I think that was always in the back of my head. You know, you never know who you're inspiring. So, right. Yeah. But thanks, Kelly. That was very sweet. Yeah. yeah. yeah no, I do. I am sweet sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> few, 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 few and far in between. <laughs> Savor it. Savor it. Right. Savor it. Yeah. yeah. Don't expect it regularly. Well, yeah. you'll have a recording of it. So you can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. You just, anytime you want. Oh, yeah. That was the time she was super you just, nice. Yeah. Just play it over and over again. <laughs> Set it as my ringtone when I call. Yeah. Wesley's so great. <laughs> That's hilarious. But no, I touched on it earlier too. I mean, Kelly and Holly have been pivotal in my in my story too. So, and I think they know that. I'm so excited to see them get married in like two, oh, three yeah. weeks. And that's yeah. coming up. Yeah, another milestone. Pretty exciting. I yeah. might cry. Oh, Uh-oh. I don't cry I'll, often. I'll, but... <laughs> save, I'll savor that. That's yeah. fantastic. Now you're gonna be uh, gonna be married just like everybody else. Yep. Yeah, wifed up, wifed up, <laughs> right? <laughs> the ball and chain so is that what they say. That's what they call it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Welcome to the crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the fam. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're gonna, really, you're really gonna like it. I, I love being married. Yeah, I already feel like I am. I mean, yeah. honestly, it's just we haven't had a ceremony, so. It's yeah. just yeah. such a yeah. I mean, I guess the 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 actual technicality of it doesn't doesn't really change things, but. I don't know. I, I felt like it did change things for, for me and my wife. I, uh, I just, I really like being married. I like having that, that person, you know, yeah. that constant, just, just my person. Yeah. And you, <laughs> yeah. And you know, for sure that like, this is your person and yeah. you know, no matter if you're just having a really hard day or a really good day, you can share that. Mm-hmm. I mean, and she can't run away. <laughs> She's contractually obligated. She is you signed right here. You signed this thing. You could probably catch her if she tried to run, though. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you did run that half marathon. So I'm in here. That was that was. You know how many times I've run since then? I could probably count it on one hand. <laughs> now, now I kind of want to get married. Mm, all right. Well, you you did talk about an Australian woman that you were talking to, no? Yeah, I'd, I'd say we're we're very far from uh, from Maryland. Yeah. <laughs> People can be on their own timeline sometimes. That, I'm that's just true. Saying. That's be true, true to your authentic self, Aaron. <laughs> yes. no. Do what you think feels don't, right. Don't don't encourage <laughs> no, no, that, that's, Yeah, not being in love with someone after the uh, first or second date is part of my recovery. No, okay, yeah. so fair. Fair. My, I was the opposite. Like some people have a hard time connection. Or having connections, I was the total opposite. I was like, "Oh, I like you. You like me. Let's do this forever." Yeah. <laughs> like, like, whoa, man, we uh, we just uh, we just ordered appetizers. <laughs> <laughs> Someone on the bus is nice to you, and you start picturing <laughs> right. your life together. Yes, yeah. hearing the wedding bells and yeah. Another oh. another way to use it's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> exactly. No, it's so true. Of course, now she can never listen to this. This is all, this is all going to be edited. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you fun. if you want a shot at all, yeah, you better. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> what do you think? So, Should we wrap this up? I, I think we've had a really good and interesting conversation. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that uh, you feel you would like to talk about before we uh, wrap it up? I don't think so. I just want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of this process and hopefully the message that we shared today will reach someone who really needed to hear it. And yeah, I just appreciate the opportunity to come on. You're very welcome. Uh, yeah. I like to thank both of you for coming on. We yeah, really definitely. wanted to do this and we think it's such an important message, you know, whether it be an addiction, whether it be sexuality, whether it be like I spoke about before the thing, I didn't even know that it was okay that I like to write, you know, that, you know, so in any kind of situation, any culture we're born in, any, town location there can be constraints and living with those constraints can just really make somebody unhappy and that can um, manifest in so many different ways and it's just freeing to just be who you are live your authentic life live your truth and do it fearlessly but also know 
I think there's going to be some uncomfortability with that, but that's where the growth happens, you know? And we just felt that was such an important message to get out. So, you know, thank you, uh, Wes, and uh, yeah. thank you, Kelly, for coming on. And hopefully uh, Adrian will be back for our next episode. But thank you so much to uh, Jacob for You're filling welcome. in. Yes, thank you, Jacob. Some, some, some big shoes to fill. I hope you guys don't get your first piece of hate mail. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we would accept it. So if you'd like to uh, send us some hate mail, feel free. Yeah. Um, you know. What do they say? All attention is good attention sometimes, yeah, yeah. you know? So uh, <laughs> that's what we're aiming to do. So I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, I just want to urge everyone to subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, please join our Facebook and Instagram community, and that's at 2 Teach One. So on Facebook and Instagram, it's T-W-O-T-E-A-C-H-O-N-E. And you can also check out our website, and it's www dot two teach one dot com that's the number two the word teach the number one dot com thanks again for joining us uh, my name is aaron i'm jacob i'm wes i'm kelly and we're out mm-hmm.